to do, are we good? Okay, to do the right things, but to lose our love for Jesus. It's so easy for us to get off track, doing the right things, just missing the heartbeat of why we do what we do. And we make so many major and minor decisions to get ahead in life for the sake of our futures. And many times we end up sacrificing our family, our friends, our church community to build something that inevitably consumes and distracts from our love for Jesus. Yet really what God wants from from us is us. Not just a part of us, but he wants all of us, all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls. And this week we want to talk about the danger of wanting and loving position and how wanting and loving position can pull and distract and really ultimately consume our love and our desire for God if we're not aware of what's happening. I was reading an article and it said this, because we think titles tell us where we stand, where we fit in, and what we think we can expect, what we want, we think it gives us ownership over others, and that by being assigned a title, we can have expectations ideally for others to meet and to exceed. Man, simply put, we believe that titles and positions identify us as respectable people, people who are able to be seen as as people who are good to look at, right? People who are going to be loved by others, There's another article that said this, in the fewest words possible, job titles allow others to know what you do, what you're responsible for, and what status you've achieved. Titles can also influence your future career, as they indicate to others where you sit in an organization's hierarchy, suggesting both the credibility and the authority that you wield. right? Position is an important thing in our society, but when it gets put into an unhealthy area of our hearts and our minds, that's when we need to start becoming aware. The psalmist says this in Psalm 75, verses 4 through 7. You might want to just dot down, jot down that address, and you can look at it in the future. But again, it's Psalm 75, verses 4 through 7. And this is what it says. It says, I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. And what we see is that we desire to be on top, to have positions and titles, but ultimately it's God who gives us position and identity and value, not the titles that we, ho- that we hold. And so I want to talk a little bit about what are a few things that we can get wrong in regards to position. And the first thing is, is that it's easy for us to believe that position equals value. That position equals value. And I think it's true for all of us in here that we all value, we all desire to be valued, don't we? Don't you desire to be valued? And what the world says is that you have to earn your stripes and pay your dues to be valued. And when we do this, the promise is that we not only gain value, but that we're going to get respect. But it's a promise that isn't often kept or held. And so what do we do? We end up chasing after the position, trained to be respected, to have to be valued, to be seen by our peers. But the issue is, is that what happens is our self-worth is dependent on us, right? It's dependent on what I can do or have done or am able to do. Another issue is that if you have to make things happen and keep it, you're going to end up ultimately failing at some point along the way. And what most likely happens is your world lives and dies on how much others value you. And that's an idol. And that's an issue that is deep within us that needs to be addressed. And the goal is that we would find our value in Christ, in Jesus, and in him alone. And the the Bible makes it so clear that our value isn't determined by the positions that we hold here on earth. 
Listen to what it says in Genesis 1, 27. It says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are created by God. He created the universe out of a single word, and it was created. I mean, this is the God who knew you and knit you together, which is the next verse from Psalm 139. Verses 13 through 14, it says this, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Man, so often we bask in position that we hold here, forgetting that we were created by the God of the universe and that he saw you in your mother's womb. He saw you being knit together. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows the thoughts that you think before you think them. Every word that comes out of your mouth. The God of the universe knows those intimate things in your life. What a position to be able to hold. Zephaniah 3.17 says this, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And I love this. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. God sees it fit to rejoice over you with gladness, to quiet you in his love, to exult over you with loud singing. We have been given an eternal position as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And so we can find rest from the toil and from the striving for position. Because our value is in the cost that Jesus was willing to pay for our position in his kingdom. He didn't withhold himself, but offered himself for us. What more value can be given than what is seen by the being a worthy recipient of the sacrifice of Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? We get to receive that sacrifice, that payment that he sacrificed himself I love what it says in Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God saw a fit for you to be sacrificed for in Jesus. Man, if we just go back to that on a regular basis, I think our worldview and the positions that we hold or don't hold or that we desire, I just think it would just be, just be set at an even level. Instead of trying to fight for all these things, it would just, our hearts would just be settled. And the positions that we hold have value because of what we bring in Christ, not because of what the position brings to us, Right? Christians have the opportunity to be the most creative, life-giving, and wise people on the face of the planet. We don't have to fight for our value given by mere man because Jesus did that and he won. He was victorious for us. But the world says that we are to fight for position and God says, I will give you position. Finding our value in Christ settles our hearts and our minds and helps us with all of those insecurities that we so often deal with. No position or title that we can have or earn can really settle us like our great comforter can. There's no one like him. But if you look through the scriptures, when we look at the Bible, our value is on what Jesus did and accomplished, and that is enough for us. So our role is to hide in Christ and in his work. The the burden of having and making and creating value is not on us. And if we would just believe it, our lives would look so different. And so we get it wrong by believing that position equals value. Another thing that we can do is that we can believe that position guarantees purpose. That if I just have a position, that I'm going to be guaranteed to have a purposeful life. An article written by Forbes says this, A study of psychosomatic medicine found when people have a greater sense of purpose, they have less incidence of cardiovascular disease and lower mortality. In addition, 
A recent study by the University of Pennsylvania found when people had a greater sense of purpose, they experienced less loneliness and made better lifestyle choices to protect their health. How interesting is that? How many of us have started a new job believing that the better pay, uh, the better work environment, or the better hours is going to make us feel more purposeful and fulfilled in our work, only to face the reality that the new position does nothing of the sort? You still feel the same as you did in the old position. This is because there isn't a problem in the position, but in your understanding of your purpose in Jesus. You see, if I'm solid in my purpose in Christ, then no matter what position I hold, whether I'm working at McDonald's, whether I'm a CEO, whether I'm a stay-at-home mom, any of those positions, because my purpose is in Jesus, is enough for me to be in. I'm not trying to fight for purpose in unforeseen worldly things. Positions cannot guarantee purpose because positions are temporary, right? They are based on earthly requirements, and they come and they go. Purpose comes from from a much greater place than just a new job or a promotion. And purpose really affects every part of us, which is why it is what we think about so often. We want to be people of purpose, and that's a good desire. But we have to seek our purpose in Jesus rather than in what the world says that we can find purpose in. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. See, vision or purpose for our lives, hearts, and sanity is really important. We perish without vision and purpose. But let's see what else the Bible says about purpose. In 1 Peter 2.9, you might want to write that one down again as well. But it says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are God's special possession. What a purpose, a special possession. What do you do with your special possessions? Where do you place them in your home? How do you interact with them? Proverbs 19.21 says this, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So all of these plans in our hearts When we surrender those over to God, then it's at that point that his purpose in our life actually moves forward. It prevails. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we can find purpose in being, one, God's handiwork, And we get to do incredible works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. And that's where we find a purpose in doing the will of God. And isn't that such an amazing truth for us that when we live out our faith, it it fills our purpose tank. And so again, we get it wrong when we believe that Position equals value. We get it wrong when we believe that position guarantees purpose. And we can get it wrong when we believe that position gives us a voice. The Missouri State University article says this, In today's world, we are bombarded with voices from all sides. The internet, social media, television, and the 24-7 news cycle offers a constant flow of information, ideas, and opinions, and widely divergent points of view. What effects do the myriad voices have on individuals, on groups, and our society at large? How do people filter out the noise to find their own voice and be heard? What is the power of voice? I think those are some really good questions for us to consider. And the reality is is that we can't stop or escape the noises of people's voices and opinions around us. They are everywhere. And there are lots of them, just like armpits. And some of them smell better than others, and some of them are more clean than others, right? So what we think is that if I work harder, 
now and I work in this incredible way to become more important and like an alpha dog, then I will gain a voice in the mix of all the other voices. And that when I get a voice, at that point, I'll be deemed successful. And I'll be deemed to be worthy to finally have a voice in the game. And so oftentimes we end up kind of listening to everything going on around us and we're waiting in silence, waiting for our 15 minutes of fame. Or we're maybe the other way, instead of waiting in silence, we're the one that's always chirping and talking. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those people that are always trying to speak and say something, even if what they say doesn't have a lot of clout or wisdom. Aristotle once said this, that a wise man has something to say, but a fool always has to say something. So what are we to do? Do we just stop talking? No. Scripture gives us some very practical ways to use our voice. Listen to this from Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Man, there's another scripture that talks about if an animal can be tamed, all sorts of them, right? Dogs, horses, but yet man can't tame his tongue. James says that. But if we would just keep our mouth and keep our our tongues to ourselves, it would keep us out of so much trouble. And that doesn't mean never speaking, but it is a call to walk in wisdom with our voices. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Any parents in the room that get that on a very real, practical way? Maybe you've dealt with a Karen out in the wilds. Maybe a, a boss where that ability to, to turn a soft answer just dissolves the harshness of the conversation. Just being gentle and being not a pushover, but just being solid in what you're saying. Aware of your tone, aware of your attitude. Just the whole conversation can take a huge turn in the right direction when we do that. Ephesians 4.15 says this, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. The call is to speak the truth in love. Right? So there's a call to be quiet, And there's a call to speak. It's both. And there's wisdom in using the ability to do both of those things at the right time in the right situation. And so we want to lean into the Holy Spirit to help us to know how to speak and when to speak. In Scripture, we see that we're to be wise with our words, but it doesn't mean that we're to just not speak. When we do, we need to do it in a way that honors God and also loves others. We don't need position to make a difference or to be heard. We just need to be kind and loving. And when we are, that is when people's ears perk up. When the agenda isn't ours, when the agenda becomes his, people's ears are hungry for truth, something that's going to last into eternity. There's a book that talks about how we can make an impact in the different positions that we hold here on earth. And it was talking about the differences between Princess Diana and Mother Teresa. And the call was that all of us desire to be like a Princess Diana. All us men in the room are probably like vying for that, right? But all the ladies, right, like, ooh, I want to be a princess. That'd be so amazing. But that's a one in a lifetime chance, right? How many princesses are there in the world? Not very many. But what about being a Mother Teresa? All of us could become a Mother Teresa, caring for the outcast, caring for the orphan, caring for children that need support and love. That's the hard work, right? That's when it's like, oh, I'm going to use my voice and actually get my hands dirty in the process. So whatever position that we do hold or where we find our life, we can make an impact in those areas. And the reality is is that we have to retrain our minds and our hearts that people listening to us doesn't mean that we have the greatest clout in the room. Let's just be content with our own voice 
and the impact that it has and just keep moving forward. We're not looking back to be applauded or to be retweeted or reposted or to receive accolades. We're just speaking the truth in love and just moving on. Let us be less concerned with being highlighted about what we say and more interested in speaking life into people. The Bible calls believers to live differently, but it also calls us to speak truth, to not shrink back in fear, but to lean forward in boldness. And I think in today's culture, it is really easy to be fearful that your words are going to be misconstrued or you're going to be seen as a hateful enemy out there. But we're not to be fearful or to, sorry, I just tapped my, tap my screen now. Um, we're, we're not to um, be fearful or to overthink our words. We're called to be wise in how and when we use our voice. I love it when Jesus was encouraging his disciples as they were preparing to face opposition and persecution, he gives them this encouragement from Matthew 10, 19 through 20. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to your father, to, given to you in that hour. For it will not be you who speaks, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. <sighs> what a refreshing truth for us to lean into tonight. What would it look like for us to live so tethered to the Holy Spirit that he fills our mouth with words from God himself? Paul encourages believers in Colossians and says this, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So we want to be wise in how we consider positions. And so let's talk briefly about how do we live this out in our life. And the first thing is that I want to encourage us to accept your position given by God. Let's be excited about what, where God has placed you. I'm a firm believer that each of us in this room has spheres of influence, if I can say that word, and there's touch points that you have that I'll never have. And there's touch points that I have that you'll never have. But those positions are in place so that God would be honored and glorified through you and that his kingdom would continue to prevail and expand. And so let us be excited about those positions, not always looking for the next place to go, but just content in the season. Contentment is an incredible gift that God gives to his believers. To be content in the midst of suffering or sacrifice or watching other people move along the way that you're hoping to move along, you having the steady heart to stay content in those moments gives you the ability to stay effective in the season that you're in. Man, if we would just stay content, not looking for the next thing. And let's use our positions to glorify God. God has placed you in those positions with a purpose. And so let's love those spots and those places that God has placed us in. Secondly, let's rest in our value that God has given us. Rest in your value from God. That your value isn't determined by what you have done or haven't done, it's determined solely by God. And so this is the moment where we take every thought captive, right? Because it's really easy for us to hear the lies of the enemy, to be discouraged for the season that you're in, to think that your words or your value are underappreciated and not good enough that the people around you who are saying, oh, you should be doing this and you should be at this point in your life at this point, your 401k should be at this level. No, no, no. I'm going to silence all of those things, not that those things aren't have good wisdom attached to them, but I'm going to find my rest in him. And let me just take us back for a moment to the Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. He will quiet you by his love. What would it look like for you this week tomorrow morning when you wake up, to be quieted by the love of God. All of those chaotic thoughts, all of those lies, all of those murmuring things that need to get done and need to be accomplished, to just, all of those things to just be quieted in the love of God. 
So the next thing that we would do is that we would learn to love your God-given voice. All of us have been given a voice. We've been given these spheres of influence, and God has given us a voice. This is one that I wrestle with a lot, personally. I'm, I find myself to be much too fearful of the things that um, people would say about me, and I'm having to learn through this, the difficulty of that and learn to love the voice that God's given me. I have the wisdom I have. I, if I don't have more, I don't have more. It is what it is. I, I can't do anything about that. But the truth that I do have is transformational because I know Jesus, right? So even if I don't have all the other wisdom in the world, it's fine. But I know Jesus, which is the greatest of wisdom, to fear him and to love, love him first, right? And so let us learn to love our God-given voice. And let's be bold. Let's be gracious in our words. Let's not, not be fearful and backpedal, but lean forward and push into those difficult conversations. And so as we consider our, our positions, let's, let's consider the fact that Jesus has made each of us here who believe in Jesus a son and daughter of God. And for anyone in the room who's not a believer, God wants to make you tonight a son or a daughter of God. That you can find rest in the position that you are firmly held by a father who is better than any father in this room and any father on the face of this planet. And that loves you deeply, rejoices over you with singing, that wants to fight on your behalf, that wants to quiet you in his love tonight. And so, Father, we just want to say thank you for what you're doing Lord, I know so often we can be so bombarded by the places that we would desire to be. We desire to find purpose. And Lord, it's so easy for my own heart to try to find those things and the things in this world. And so I, I know that that's probably true for those in this room as well. And so I pray tonight that you would remind us of the great love of God for us, that you would remind us that our position in you is held firmly, that there's no one and nothing that can snatch us from the hand of God. We take great delight in that tonight. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity for us to be reminded through the blood and the cracker, the, the juice and the cracker that we partake of right now, or to be reminded of your sacrifice, to be reminded that we are worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus to offer himself on our behalf, Lord. And so we receive that tonight, Lord. We receive it in faith, knowing full well that you love us deeply, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.